So it's very nice to be here. I'm Andrea Barizani. Uh, I spoke here the last time in 2016, so uh, eight years ago. So I'm, I'm really, really glad to be to be here back on stage in this great venue. So I'm. Some of you may know me for the USB Armory project. I work at Wit Secure. Before that, I I started a company called Inverse Path where. Uh, we focus on security of all kind of systems that used to be exotic and now they're not exotic anymore like cars, airplanes, uh, industrial system and so forth. So I test embedded systems for a living, uh, which is all to buy me time to do climbing and ski touring. That's, that's all I want to do other than hacking. So, uh, it's very good to be here. So I'm here actually, uh, to talk about I guess the culmination of our USB Armory project and one of the best applications that we devised for it, which is very nice because back when I was here in 2016, uh, I spoke about the first version of the USB Armory and, you know, I, I, I also look at the video, uh, of 2016 before coming here and oh boy, you know, 80 years is such a long time and, and how things have changed. So I'm really glad that I could be here to talk to you about the one of the applications that we're doing with this open hardware and for actually the second incarnation of this project. And so what I'm going to talk about is a collaboration that we did with the Google Transparency Project, uh, which uh, if you don't know what it is about, go to transparency.dev. So it's a it's an ecosystem made of entirely open source libraries and tools, including this one, now uh, to basically create an open source uh, verifiable log, which is based on Merkle trees. So if you don't know what a Merkle tree is, is a data structure which allows you to create a log uh, where uh, if you change any entry in this log, it cascades very quickly to uh, to the top hash. It's, it's, a, it's a blockchain, basically, but it's used here in this context for uh, reasons which are very different from, you know, the traditional use of this term for Bitcoin and transactions and so forth. So uh, we work together with the Google Transparency Project to uh, use and develop software and hardware that would help uh, the Google Transparency Project for the goals that uh, that we're gonna that we're gonna see soon. So what is Transparency Project about? So the Transparency Project is mainly known for certificate transparency, uh, which uh, is a project which allows to see and to track which certificates have been issued, which, been, which CAs for which domains and when. So the whole point of this exercise is to detect if at some point someone is either trying to rewrite history or if a signing key is compromised and then someone is issuing a certificate for uh, for a website they're not they're not they're not supposed to so detect maliciously or mistakenly issued certificates this is one of the first uses of the transparency projects and probably the most widely used is that there's a whole framework for certificate transparency which under the hood is being implemented by all different browsers and and entities that do that do that do TLS but uh, the transparency project wants to take this uh, use of Merkle trees further and to enable it to do more things. So one of the other uh, outstanding examples of the use of these of this technology is tamper checking for package managers. So the idea is that even if we have a log which is out there which publishes signatures for every package that is being released for, let's say, uh, an operating system, a distribution, or in this example for the Go, Golang ecosystem. So every time you install uh, a Go package with, with Go mod, you're going to check and hit actually this technology, which is called SumDB. So what this technology enables is a skeptical interaction with the log itself. So we don't trust the log. We're not trusting uh, the hosting provider for the log to, to, to have uh, secure storage of, of, of this log. And so we want to enable an ecosystem that allow auditors to interact skeptically with this log and to gossip among themselves to understand whether this log is being compromised or not. And every time you install a Go package, this actually happens. So the Go command checks for an inclusion proof so that a specific record exists in the log and for a consistency proof. So to make sure that the log hasn't been tampered with so that even 
uh, the provider of the log itself, even if they have the signing keys, they cannot rewrite history and go back in the past and maybe put a backdoor uh, in, you know, a version of a package that has already been released. So this is what this technology uh, allows you allows you to do. And it, you know, it happens if you if you check your Go dot sum uh, database when you install packages. Uh, this information is used to enable specifically this. Now, to take this further, we have also the binary transparency project, uh, which protects basically the supply chain, uh, for, uh, for the release of binaries which are out there when you, when you, when you just want to download a release. And, and if we take into account that these days we can have reproducible builds for, for code, which means that if I publish an open source repository, and I also publish a binary for a release, you can reproduce the exact same binary to check as an auditor that the source code that I publish out there and that I claim has been compiled into that binary actually matches that. So this is something that the auditors can do. So this log can contain claims that as a package releaser, uh, I would make to the outside world. So I could claim that this binary has been released consistently with that source code, that those environment variables were used, uh, that this is the date that it has been released, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. And this is especially important for secure booted systems, because sometimes, uh, as a vendor, you put out there some hardware which is secure booted, which means that it can only run code which is signed by the vendor itself. But you also want to give proof that the binary that I'm releasing that is signed is actually matching maybe some open source code which is out there. And so you achieve two goals. You have hardware which is locked down to securely execute some specific binary, but at the same time you allow the user to check that the source code that matches that binary is exactly the one that is supposed to run on that device. And so we use this technology as part of our USB armory uh, project. So if you don't know what the USB armory is, so for a show of hands, who knows what the USB armory is? Let me see how popular the device is. Okay, a few people. So if you don't know what it is, it's an open hardware, uh, and an open ecosystem of, of tools and libraries, uh, which basically we developed to create this very tiny embedded system. It used to be USB type A back when I, I spoke here in 2016. Now we have dual type C. So it's a very tiny device which targets um, applications such as encrypted storage, hardware security modules, and on smart cards, and, and so forth. It's all open, open hardware, open software, the PCB layout, the schematics, everything has been done also with open source tool, and it's all uh, out there, and it's designed to fit in a pocket, uh, in a laptop, or the back of a server. And so, while developing this open hardware, we also develop a few applications for it. And one of these applications, uh, it's Armory Drive, which is basically a firmware uh, that enables to use the device as an encrypted drive. Again, it's all open source. It uses a framework which we call Tamago, which I'm going to explain in detail what is it about. So let's hold that thought for a second. And so basically, when we develop this, this solution, which is very simple, you have your phone, it is paired with the device, you click unlock on your phone, it does uh, an authenticated and mutually, an encrypted and mutually authenticated exchange with the device, and before this you were not seeing anything, and then suddenly you see a drive, which you can use, but the drive is encrypted under the hood with a key which is derived from both your phone and from the hardware itself. And so when we develop this uh, firmware, we want it to be as transparent, as verifiable as possible. And this is how we got to interact with the Google Transparency Project, because we basically wanted to make sure that not only uh, you as a user installing a firmware on the device would be sure that you're putting some legitimate firmware on the device itself, but also that the hardware itself would be able to verify that the firmware that is receiving is consistent with all the previous releases that have been done. And this is particularly important also because this device can be secure booted. And you as a user, you have the option to keep it open, to lock it down with our own keys, so vendor keys, but also to lock it down with your own keys if you want. So we have a flow which allows you, in case the device, you decide to lock it down with our own keys to verify that the firmware that you're installing is, is, is legitimate. 
And so we use the Merkle tree to sign all the releases that there are ever being created uh, for this device, and we verify these releases at, at two levels. So one at an installer level. We have an installer which uh, asks you how you want to provision the device. So in this case, it will ask you if you want to use on-site releases without enabling secure boot, or if you want to permanently enable secure boot on the device, and if you want to enable secure boot with vendor keys or with your own keys. So it gouges you through something which is fairly complex in the hardware wor world, which is provisioning secure boot on a device. It downloads the firmware releases from GitHub in this case, and it does verify using uh, Merkle tree structures and the firmware transparency libraries that all the, the releases up to this one that you're installing have, have always been uh, consistent with the signing keys that are, that are out there. And so basically, it is verifying that the claims that we're making about the firmware are legitimate, and then it provisions the device with, uh, with, the, with the keys. And now, and this uh, inclusion verification is not only performed by the installer, which is also open source, so the tool that downloads the firmware, provisions secure boot on the device, and puts the firmware on the device, but also by the firmware itself. So once a hardware device is provisioned with the firmware, from then on, it will only receive firmware updates that are consistent with the log of releases that have been, uh, that have been released by, by, by us. Um, the device itself does not have network access, so it will always check the previous checkpoint of the log, but as we're building this append-only log which is verifiable, it can always, the device can always ensure that we are not rewriting history and that every user is seeing exactly the same trail of releases so that if for some reason we uh, become uh, a threat, an opponent, and let's say that we want to uh, release a different set of uh, binaries for a specific country and we create a so-called split view attacks, then this kind of system can, can help uh, preventing, preventing that. And so this happens both on the installer and the device itself, even if the device has no, has no networking. And since the device is secure booted, it can store data in an encrypted way, it also provides some, some tamper proof, um, some tamper resistance uh, proof, we never use the word proof, it's, it's, it's bad, 100% security doesn't exist. It is tamper resistant, so to speak. But now, this whole transparency concept works if uh, a few elements are in place. So first of all, there's need to be a log at the center which provides you proof which are cryptographically verifiable and that they are in append-only fashion. And we said that this can achieve with a Merkle tree uh, structure. So anyone that is, um, that relies on these artifacts that we're releasing, or these releases, needs to, of course, to check the log before, before using them. Uh, that we have more than one entity out there which is able to verify this. And also, and this is the point of the project and I'm gonna discuss it here, which is the Armory Witness, that everyone listed above sees the same list of entries in the log. This is the, the last element, and this is what we work uh, with, with the transparency team for. So to create a witness that specifically would verify this aspect. So a witness verifies a pen only operation of one or more logs. So of course here I mentioned our Armory Drive firmware, but these logs exist out there for varied ecosystems. Um, and the witness countersign the checkpoints if it's convinced that a checkpoint is consistent with all the previously the previous checkpoints issued for the same log. And so if we have a network of witnesses that constantly does this process of countersigning all of these checkpoints, then we can detect immediately if there's a split view attack, if these checkpoint, checkpoints are made, uh, if these countersigned checkpoints are published out there. So we ensure that there's only one view of a log. So no one can rewrite history uh, for uh, for releases. And this is actually what the Go module ecosystem, when it was launched, uh, that they anticipated it would be needed. Uh, they, there's the need for third party auditors to work together and gossip about the state of the tree as it grows to ensure that it remains uncompromised. And we hope that the Go community will run them. 
this uh, combination of hardware and software that we call the Armory Witness specifically enables this, and not only for the Go ecosystem, but for any ecosystem which uses uh, which uses the transparency framework for uh, providing signatures out there. So in order to achieve this goal, the idea has been to develop a hardware witness, so a device uh, which we would give out there to custodians and that it would help to monitor ecosystems such as the Go database, Six Store, the Pixel uh, phone uh, binary transparency database, LVFS, SIGSUM, and, you know, last, because it's the least important here, our Armory Drive firmware. Uh, the requirement is to have low-touch maintenance-free operations, so a sort of plug-and-forget device, and a device which, in the way it is devised and developed, also applies the same principles that we want to promote here, so to promote firmware transparency uh, in itself. So, and... The goals is that this device needs to be fully transparent, so open hardware and open software, to have a re reduce attack surface and to be plug and go. And the USB Armory is a good candidate for this because we tick all the boxes. The hardware is fully open or as open as it can be. We have a framework called Tamago, which I'm gonna explain what it is, which reduces the attack surface dramatically. And, and with the firmware that we've developed in collaboration with, with Google, it is as plug, plug and go as possible. And so let's see how this was achieved. So first of all, this was a great opportunity to create a new version of the USB Armory, which we still maintain as open hardware. So basically we took our USB only device. So uh, if you remember one of the earliest slides, the USB Armory has uh, uh, both a plug and a receptacle for USB type C. Um, so we created a power over Ethernet version of this device. So we basically replaced the uh, USB Type-C uh, plug with a power over Ethernet uh, jack. So which means that we can just plug a power over Ethernet cable on this device and it just power up, power ups in boots and, and it works. Uh, we, uh, the device has, it can have between half a, a gigabyte and one gigabyte of RAM. It has internal storage. There's an EMMC of 16, 16 gigabytes. There's an external secure uh, element on the device as well as security properties in the system on chip. Uh, and we have 100 megabits per second uh, Ethernet and we also have uh, a USB Type-C uh, receptacle uh, in, in the back. So you can power it up from both Ethernet as well as uh, USB. And it has a set of hardware uh, security features which are appealing for this kind of application. So first of all, we have secure boot and we support secure boot all with open source tools. So all the tools which are binary blobs from the uh, system on chip vendor, which is NXP, we rewrote as open source tools so that you can know exactly what is going on. It has cryptographic accelerator on board and true random number generation. It has secure non-volatile storage, which is useful for storing the checkpoints for storing uh, logs and data so that it cannot be easily tampered with. We also have on the fly RAM encryption. So there's uh, something called the bus encryption engine, which allows uh, AES encryption and decryption on the fly of the entire uh, external memory, which also provides uh, improved resistance against tampering because it means that even if we mount a very advanced attack on the, on the DRAM chip, which is on the device, uh, everything will be encrypted with a key which is only known to the internal registers of the CPU. Uh, and we also have replay protected memory blocks. So on the MMC, we can have a, 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 a region which is protected with a password where we can only bump a monotonic counter. And this is also really important to prevent rollback attacks where we take an older version of the MMC uh, and we solder it back to the hardware so the, the main CPU will know that it's not supposed to run an older version of the firmware uh, because, uh, because the replay protected memory block uh, has a mismatch. So we, we have these features which make, make it really good to do trusted execution and protected execution of, of firmware, both um, in boot authentication as well as runtime authentication. But then, of course, uh, it, it raises the question, we want to reduce the attack surface, so how are we going to execute code on it? Do we want to put Linux? Do we want to put a complex C-based bootloader? And this is where our Tamago framework comes in. So 
The Tamago framework spawns from the desire of reducing as much as possible the attack surface of embedded systems such as this one. We want to remove any runtime dependency on, on C code, on code that we cannot control easily, uh, and on complex operating system when, when the only thing that we want to do is launch a firmware that maybe is 10,000 lines of high level code. And, you know, we want to, uh, uh, of course, you could do that with an operating system, but the operating system just shifts, shifts, shifts complexity away. So we don't want complexity to exist anywhere on this system. Uh, and so the Tamago framework aims to run a high-level language directly on the bare metal without the need for uh, underlying support by an operating system. And this, basically, this need spawned from the fact that this is uh, how we used to create firmware for the USB armory. If we look at the talk that I made here in 2016, this is one of the slides that I was using to show how firmware can be secure for this device. And this is why I say that eight years change a lot. So in a typical embedded Linux system for this kind of system on chips, you have your CPU, which holds keys for secure boot, which usually are permanently fused on the device. Uh, it authenticates a bootloader, which these days is a fairly complicated piece of C code. It supports many, many things, networking and so forth. Um, and the bootloader is your first ring in the chain of trust. So if you compromise the bootloader, you compromise the whole chain of trust here. Then you authenticate and boot a Linux image, which typically would start a decryption procedure with uh, key derivation on the hardware, and then decrypt the full runtime. And there's a lot going on in all of this. The bootloader has probably 100,000 lines of code. Linux has millions of lines of code. And in the end, all of this is to decrypt a single Go binary, which runs 10,000 lines of code. And of course, you need to maintain all of this. It's not a fire and forget, or a plug and go and forget uh, firmware. It's not maintenance free. Uh, I don't think, even if there are maybe no outstanding CVEs for your application and you reduce the attack surface as much as possible, I don't think you would want to run two years the same old Linux kernel on such a device, especially when it takes such, a, such an important role. And so for this, what we aim with Tamago is to basically take a high-level language such as Go, which is easy to use, it's very, uh, it leads to high productivity, and it facilitates implementation safety, and give it as much hardware control as possible to bring it to levels of hardware control very similar to C and Rust, but without the complexity that these languages entails. Uh, and so this is what basically Tamago uh, does. And, you know, you might think about you have unikernels, you have library operating systems that kind of do the same thing, that you have this small application and you can, and you can execute it. But, you know, they always have a kernel underneath. And, and in the end, again, they just hide complexity uh, away. In the end, they have a fairly sizable C kernel underneath, which more often than not is outdated. And so what Tamago is, is a minimally patched Go distribution, emphasis on the minimally, because trust is important in these projects, which basically allows freestanding execution of Go and any Go library on the bare metal. And we have hardware support for a few system on chips. And of course, our primary target is the one that we use here on, on the USBR. Um, the modifications to the compiler are about 4,500 lines of code. So it's a very minimal and non-invasive patching to the original Go runtime. And more than half of these lines of code are actually copied and pasted and reused from existing sections of, of the runtime. And what this allows is that we can have low level access in Go. So we can write and read registers. And we can even do it only with very, very few unsafe pragmas throughout the code, which are there are only three occurrences of unsafe packages used within the code. So it's also very easy to audit where uh, things go wrong. We can write. Uh, DMA in peripheral memory, and so which means that we can also write all the drivers that we need uh, directly uh, in in Go. So if a traditional uh, operating system would look like the picture on top, where you have your user space supporting the Go runtime, making system calls to your kernel, your kernel has your drivers and talks to the peripherals. With a Tamago unikernel, you just compile a single Go application, and the Go application includes in itself all the libraries, all the initialization which is needed to boot, and also to provide uh, mock system calls that the Go runtime can use in a, uh, in a, in a, by 
supporting itself. So the Go runtime supports itself the system call that it needs uh, to, to execute. Developing, building, and running with Tamago is identical to standard Go libraries, which also means that all the Go ecosystem features such as build, reproducibility, dependency management, profiling, and debugging, they all remain intact. Intact. So think about it. You can have a, a bare metal firmware and you can debug it with your net pprof. You know, you can connect to it with your web server. You can do goal tracing. All of the things that you can do in a user space application, you are doing them on this sort of library uh, operating system. And with just a single import of a package, you have all the hardware initialization that you need. Uh, and firmware can be compiled uh, just as easily on Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. So all the Go ecosystem advantages, they are translated to firmware creation. And unlike Rust, where uh, you must not use, you must enable the no STD pragma, you cannot use the standard library when running on the bare metal. With Tamago, you can use the entire uh, runtime of Go, every library, uh, as long as it's, it's not, of course, a library that expects Linux to be there. So a library that does OS.exec, of course, you will not use it here because there's no OS. But, you know, any other library parser, you can use it natively without requiring any modifications. And this means that we are not only we transition driver creation to a memory safe language, we minimize the code base, but we minimize the attack surface because the line of code counts is very minimal. So just to give you a little bit of perspective, this is the line of code counts for a few of the drivers that we have. The USB stack is 12, 1200 lines of code. I actually almost know it by heart. Uh, so, because it's very compact, the MMC SD card driver, which was probably one of the most complicated things I had to do in my life because I had to read the standards, which I hope you don't have to do that in your life. It's a thousand one hundred lines. Um, the bus encryption engine, the, the driver that performs memory encryption and decryption is 130 lines of code. Uh, the Ethernet driver, 370 lines of code. So you can see this is all very, very minimal uh, code base. And so in your application also is capable of uh, self-booting. You don't need the bootloader anymore. So if you remember the, di the diagram that we had earlier with the system on chip running the bootloader, running the operating system, uh, now the system on chip jumps directly into your uh, Go compile binary without the need for uh, an intermediate bootloader. And so we basically removed uh, every single line, every single dependency of memory unsafe code from the running firmware because we just jumped directly to the Go runtime with uh, less than 10 lines of assembly in between the system on chip jumping to uh, user application code. So memory safety is much improved, as well as convenience, because you have the same library on your desktop, on your server, and on your embedded device. So for this specific application, we have the libraries that are used for the cryptographic verification of the inclusion proof. It's the same library that is used on the Armory Drive installer, that is used on Google server, and it's also used on the device. Same code. So there's no need to have different versions, different incarnations of, of the same library. So just to give you a quick demo of what Tamago can look like. So this is, uh, I'm running here in QEMU uh, a firmware, uh, which uh, just started a web server, an SSH server. And here I'm logging in. So everything that is happening here, so the TCP IP stack, the SSH implementation, everything is written uh, in, in Go. And so this firmware is a few, uh, I think it's about 200 lines of code for having the, the whole connectivity here. And so we have a full working, uh, addressable, uh, and, and, in, you know, there's a web server running here as well. So this is just a firmware which is running, uh, in, in, in pure, in pure Go. So, and let me close this down. Okay. And so with this, um, with this capability, we created, uh, you know, a few firmwares. We created, for instance, a smart card written in Tamago, but it's a smart card that you, you don't unlock with a conventional pin. You SSH into the smart card. So Tamago, what also allows you to do is to mix layers that traditionally are very difficult to mix together. I mean, you wouldn't think that your smart card can have TCP IP connectivity 
and that you can do mutual authentication to, to unlock it. But with Tamago, this code can go e coexist at the same abstraction level. Uh, what I like to say is that firmware developed for this hardware with Tamago kind of looks like pseudocode, but in reality, it is, it is production code. This is the advantage of it. The bootloader, so we created a bootloader for Linux in Go because it makes it really easy to use whatever modern cryptographic library that you want, whether it's conventional or post-quantum, whatever you want to do at a bootloader stage, you can do it with Tamago. And so our bootloader for the USB armory, even if we boot the Linux system, it is done in, in Tamago, and it's about 300 lines of code, which again helps to reduce the attack surface and the auditability of, of the system. So we replace U-boot uh, with this, with this system. And to push it even further, um, we, uh, created, uh, also a trusted execution environment entirely in Go. So we created Goti, which allows you to use Truston and to supervise, uh, Rust, C, Go, or Linux coexisting at the same time, uh, in, uh, different security domains. And so this is an example of Goti running and spawning different firmware, so the different colors are different firmware at the different um, privilege level. And this is probably one of the most intimate and low-level interactions that you can do with the hardware, and we're doing it with something that is very high level. So traditionally trusted execution environments are written in assembly and C, and here we prove that we can, uh, we can do it in Go. To further uh, support the resilience of all of this, the USB Armory and Tamago, they also have been in space. So uh, last year and this year, uh, so we went twice in space, so Goti supervised a Tamago-based unikernel doing post-quantum key exchanges uh, while uh, 225 kilometers in, in orbit. And we took this chance to develop watchdog and interrupt support in Go, which, you know, I think to me it's, uh, it's also pretty crazy that we can have interrupt handling in such a such a high, such a high level language. And so all of these pieces together, they were perfect for creating a hardware witness because we have open source hardware and software. We can reduce the attack surface and we can have a bootloader, our open system and an applet written entirely in these frameworks. So an armory witness is actually composed of a bootloader. The reason why the bootloader is needed is because we want to activate full RAM encryption. So we want to encrypt the entire memory space. So in order to do that, we need to first activate RAM encryption and decryption and then jump to the operating system. So that's the only reason why we have a bootloader. And since we're at it, we also uh, verify the signature of the US and we execute it. And so 400 lines of code, the armored witness boot is the minimal bootloader that allows you to uh, achieve this. Then we have the operating system. So the operating system, about 2000 lines of code, uh, what it does, it provides the Ethernet driver and it provides access to storage so that in the future we can have uh, more than one applet working on the same hardware and using different storage, not colliding with the other applets and having derived keys which are, uh, which are different. So in fact, the operating system also can derive hardware unique and applet unique keys uh, for, for the finite, final applet that is running. And then we have the applet itself, which runs in user mode. And what is really interesting, in my opinion, is that the TCP IP stack lives in the applet. It lives in user mode. Because the idea is that we want to take the attack surface as much as possible away from the operating system. And so while the operating system runs the Ethernet driver, which again, 370 lines of code, very basic, the full TCP IP stack, which we pull from, from GVisor, by the way, because they have a full Go a TCP IP stack implementation, we use that in the user mode application. So that even if for some reason the applet gets compromised, despite its reduced attack surface, you know, the TCP IP stack is not running in the operating system. And the applet itself, what it does, it allocates the stack, so it does DHCP and TP requests. Uh, it requests to the OS a hardware key which is unique for, uh, for that specific hardware and for that specific applet. And it runs the Google Transparency Project Omni Witness Code, which is this transparency witness that constantly verifies all the available logs, stores all the checkpoints, and publishes countersign uh, checkpoints. 
So all the formal verification, which is done here, except for the very first part, which is the, we go from gray to blue. So the very first part, of course, is done by, by, with the code, which is in the boot room of the system on chip. So that's outside our control. But everything that happens after that is done through formal transparency proof bundles. So we use the same, uh, technology to verify, uh, this chain of trust. Which also means that we can do some sort of multi-party verification. So in this case, we verify that the bootloader and the firmware, uh, can be signed, uh, by more than one party. So for instance, with Secure and, and Google. So we can do advanced schemes which go beyond what the basic hardware, uh, can do. And the operating system and the applet, they must be published on the firmware transparency log before being usable on the device. In the same fashion as the armory drive, the device itself verifies that, uh, that, uh, it is receiving, uh, binaries for update which are, uh, included, uh, in, in the log. The firmware is entirely open source. It's all written in Tamago. It's build reproducible by anyone and, and logged. There's a provisioning tool, like in the case of Armory Drive. There's a verification tool, so a custodian that received the device can connect in serial download mode. Serial download mode means that you plug a USB cable, you're not executing the firmware, you're just executing a low-level function in the boot room, which gives you access to what is stored on the MMC uh, of the hardware, and it can verify that the firmware that is supposed to run on the device is, is on the device itself. So you can inspect what's on the device before executing it. And then you can verify all the builds before, uh, doing, doing updates. And the entire software bill of material, given that this is Go, it's a single Go mod file, which also means that it's very easy to get dependency graphs, to get the CV, uh, tracking. You know, if you're on GitHub, you would get that automatically. So we get all the benefits from the Go uh, ecosystem. The, Go, the, the code is very readable, despite doing very complex applications, uh, you know, few snippets of code. This is the uh, uh, full memory encryption activation. Um, this is how we map the memory. I'm going fast because I have seven minutes and I would love to get a question if you have. This is the replay protected memory block initialization. It's all very, it's not code which is not dense. It's code that even if I wrote it many years ago, in some cases, I can, I can understand and can remember what it does. And I cannot say the same thing for my C and C++ uh, code. There's an um, RPC uh, interface between the applet and the operating system, which uses standard uh, gRPC libraries from Go. So we take a library which has never been meant, is never meant to do such an intimate low-level communication, but well, we can just use it because we run Go on the bare metal. So we can use gRPC uh, as an interface. And the same thing for interrupt and Cisco handling. You know, we just do it in Go. We receive an interrupt. We understand what it is. And when we call, we call the function that we want. We can use Go routines. We can sleep. We can use channels for coordinating the different uh, Go routines that are running on the device. You know, so a massive benefit from from having uh, the Go runtime running on the bare metal. So putting it all together, this is the device that we created. Uh, we created also an enclosure for it. Uh, they are being uh, disseminated as we speak. And what this applet does, it observes uh, public transparency logs. They verify that they're operating in an append-only fashion. And the checkpoints which are verified are countersigned. And that countersigning is can be published uh, anywhere you want. Uh, traditionally, they're sent to a so-called distributor. So by doing this, we remove trust from the log operator, and we put some trust in the witness. But the witness itself, so in order to uh, break that trust, it means that a large number of parties will need to collude uh, in order to, to, to hide any form of malicious behavior. And we minimize the amount of trust which is required by being as open, as transparent as possible on these devices. Because short of having a completely open silicon implementation, which uh, really doesn't exist uh, these days, you know, this is as, as good uh, as it gets. So uh, this is a demo on the way on how uh, a witness works. Uh, let's see, so here I'm running a witness. It's starting, verifying uh, a bundle. Uh, it's running DHCP. 
uh, even if I don't have a server here, so I have a static address. It's also doing NTP, so now it got the time. Uh, remember, all of this is user mode, pure Go code, doing this kind of network operations. And in a few seconds, the witness will start to monitor the logs which are out there. I don't have a, uh, I don't have a distributor set up, so that's why it says to fail to distribute, but this firmware is now doing the witnessing, and we can just, and we can just leave it there. And we can also SSH to it. And we can, oops, sorry. The key changes every time, so. So we can connect to it. We can dump the Go routines which are running. We can have status information and all of this. So I'm actually, so there are two runtimes which are running here. The Go runtime of the operating system and the Go runtime of the applet. Here I'm connecting to the Go runtime of the applet because the operating system doesn't have a TCP uh, IP stack. And we can do other cool things with this. So for instance, uh, how many of you know Tailscale? The VPN service Tailscale, do you know about it? So there's a Go library for it. So we can have, so this device that I'm connecting to, let's see if network works, crossing fingers. So this is a Tailscale connected device. So this is part of my private VPN and I have pure Go code uh, here running, so this device has been out for a week and one day, and it also has the code for doing the witnessing, so it's also witnessing the GoSum database, the SIG store database, Armory Drive, and the Android binary transparency firmware, and again, it's running happily into my, into my tailnet, you know, without a single line of C code uh, in, in sight. So, this is uh, an example of the provisioning tool, which allows you to automatically uh, provision a device with secure boot and with the firmware while doing all the verifications that I mentioned. Uh, we have a Docker environment to reproduce the builds that we're running and to check that the same build is running on the device. So there are tools that allows you automatically to take the source code, build it, connect to the device, and verify that the firmware is the same. So we try to automate that as much as possible. And then we have this verification tool to make sure that if you receive an existing device, you can verify that the firmware that is running on is the one that we're claiming uh, should run on that uh, device. Uh, these are all the resources for the project. Uh, again, all the hardware uh, schematics and PCB are out there. All the tools that you need to provision the device are out there. Tamago, of course, is also out there, open source. We have our trusted execution environment. And finally, these three elements wrapped together, they uh, can lead to the Armored Witness Project, which uses these components to do its work. So this is the, the project that we created. I hope you uh, enjoy the aim that you're going for, and I thank you so much for your time. And if you have any questions, I think we have a minute. I would be very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any questions? We still have one minute to go. There's one hand. You can shout it, I'll repeat it for the online stream. Or I'll try at least. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the question was, Ethernet drivers are currently yeah. in kernel space. Have you thought about pushing yeah. to user land mode? Yes. So uh, in the way we split the code base, we assess that the Ethernet driver is so simple that it really doesn't pose a meaningful attack surface. But we could definitely move that to the user space application. The difference is that instead of having an RPC between the applet and the OS, which is for uh, receiving and transmitting packets, it becomes something for receiving and transmitting the network buffer that needs to be written in the register or, or the, of the Ethernet driver. I think that from a security standpoint, it is maybe best as an abstraction separation to have register read and write in the kernel, in the OS, opposed to the applet itself, because you know, if you mess up the validation of the calls from the applet to the OS, you basically can write anywhere. 
and this cannot happen at the moment. But you could definitely do it. It, it would be possible to do so. I think that it would be pushing the abstraction a little bit too much, uh, in my opinion. That's all. But, but it can be done. Another question? All right. Um, yeah, let's do one last question. Go ahead, shout. I did, sorry, I didn't hear the first part. Can you? Yes. Yeah. So smart cards yeah. are supported, can they be used for Windows logon? So our GoKey project implements an open source, open PGP smart card with also UTF support. So we kind of emulate a YubiKey. Um, I'm not sure what Windows logon requires right now. If you just want to emulate, emulate an HID device or if there's more involvement in the protocol, right now we don't support it because I don't know how that works because I'm a mostly a Linux user. But again, the code is such a high level that if you want to extend that application, I think it would be perfectly, perfectly doable to do so. In fact, anybody that wants to learn how a smart card works, I just tell them to, to go and look at the code code that we have, even if they're not using it, because it's very readable. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure it can be extended for, uh, for that. Awesome. That's all the time we have left for, yeah. but you're still around. I'm so around, if you have any so please come ask me questions. I'll be very happy. Thank you so much. Thank you much.